Hey, everybody, this is Carl White broadcasting actually from my kitchen today here at the secret headquarters of the Mortgage Marketing Animals. And you're listening to Loan Officer Freedom, number one podcast in the world today for loan officers. And I'm uh, interviewing or just having a, a, a candid conversation with my longtime dear friend, uh, Brian Stevens from MortgageShots.com. And we're going to discuss, uh, Brian was on the Breakfast Club, Loan Officer Breakfast Club uh, the other day. And uh, boy, brought up some great points on this new NAR settlement. And uh, Brian, I thought we'd hit the record button and do it as a podcast because I know it's going to be on a lot of people's minds as they're as the loan officers are talking to the real estate agents. It's likely to come up in conversation, or if they're uh, down at the um, uh, real estate association, certainly this is going to be a topic that's coming up. And I thought maybe you could just kind of give us the inside scoop, the best that you know it. Uh, exactly what is this? What does it mean? And what does it mean to my real estate agent friends? And what does it mean to me as a loan officer in my case, or as a branch manager? So, uh, so uh, good to see you. Good to see you, Brian. Hey, yeah, likewise, you know, in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the pre-recording Carl and I were having a reflective conversations about a conversation about moments in our life that uh, kind of change things, you know, just a, a very, very clearly defined chapters, individuals who have made our lives better uh, to get us to where we're at right now. And I, I think everybody has that to a certain extent. Uh, take that same logic and apply that to this business. We're having one of those moments right now. Like this is a seminal moment in the annals of, of, of real estate. Things have fundamentally and permanently changed. Now, there's a lot of speculation that's going on about what's going to take place. And, and nobody really knows what the outcome is going to be because there's variables, you know, at the table in play right now, Carl, that we just, we, we can speculate, we can analyze, we can, you know, kind of try to figure how it's going to play out. But then we also don't know how the regulators are going to take how it plays out. So there's a lot of things. The only thing that we can do at this point is give a, you know, um, our, our input as to where we're at and what we know for sure. So absolutely what we know for sure is all we have to do is listen to what NAR says. And, and, and it's, it's easy to listen to all the talking heads, but sometimes we just have to go right to, uh, you know, the horse's mouth. So NAR, the day after this uh, $416 million settlement came out, they said, in addition to the financial payments, NAR has agreed to put in place a new MLS rule prohibiting um, offers of broker compensation on the MLS. That's their words, not mine. So I have to take that as being factual. We are going to take away an offer of commission we are going to remove that from every MLS that we control and by extension, the MLSs that they don't control, but the ones that they can influence. So let's think about that for a second. So what that means is real estate agents then are going to have to come up with their, their own opinion, their own interpretation of how they're going to get paid. What this tells me, what I just heard from NAR is, is that we are getting out of the commission game. We're getting out of the income game with our representative constituents, which if you're getting out of the income game for your representative constituents, what good are you anymore? That's why you're there to protect their livelihood. And if we're to distill your livelihood down to its simplest component, it's what you make for a living. Carl, I know you love what you do. I know you do. I, I, I Our conversations on and off air, tell me you love what you do. But if you quit making money at it, you would find something else to do and then maybe do this as a hobby. So this is where real estate agents are at. So that tells me then, logically, if we're to deduce this down to, to its simplest components once again, we have to conclude that real estate agents are going to try to find their own way on how they're going to get paid. After all, people are going to show houses and people are going to need, need to get paid for that. Here, here's, here's where it gets sticky. We know that 75% of the people in this country don't have the money in their savings account to change a tire if it were to blow up tomorrow. How the heck are they going to pay a real estate agent five thousand dollars, you know, for their for their effort, service, and time? And the answer is they're not going to. So I think immediately what's going to happen is that commissions are going to go down. I think immediately there's going there's spots in your many of our multiple listing systems where they're going to say, hey, listen, this property is going to pay a commission. I think immediately uh, agents who are listing properties are going to list them for four and a half, maybe five percent. And they're going to have to stipulate somewhere in there that they're going to pay a buyer side commission. I think this is what brokerages are going to do. Now, what we also know is that real estate companies, they sell real estate for a living. That's, that's what they do. And I, as I've said before, lawyers sue people for a living. 
That's what they do. Um, as long as there is a precedence out there that what the real estate community did was illegal, immoral, and wrong, they're going to continue to get sued. They're going to continue to get sued because lawyers sue for a living and they see a lot of money and a lot of opportunity with what's taking place. So any one of these individual settlements is not settling everything because there could be broad interpretation state by state in terms of what's taking place. And that will continue to happen until there is no meat left on the bone, not even for, for the vultures. So when you look at um, you know properties uh, that have been sold with every single brokerage over the past five years, every single one of them, they're in play. In fact, in Vacaville, California, where I live, every single brokerage is currently being sued. Every single one of them. Now, many of these brokerages are, they, they, they work on fine lines. They, they work on lean amounts. But they don't have the money. They don't have the resources. They don't have the capital to fight lawsuits who lawyers can continue to file these, you know, in, in a very, very simple manner. Um, they're going to go under. The large brokerages who have all these legacy transactions, they're going to continue to get sued and they're going to be preoccupied with that. And they're not going to be able to focus on what their what their role is, which is to sell real estate. Um, I, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I think this is pretty clear. I think a lot of our larger brokerages out there are not going to be large, uh, are not going to be in existence uh, in the coming years. Frankly, I think the same thing is taking place with our mortgage companies right now. And <clears throat> so how does that affect the individual real estate agent or a loan officer? Well, it's very simple. They're not going to go after the individual real estate agent because there's not enough meat on that bone. Filing that lawsuit is going to be more expensive and prohibitive. So they're not going to do that. With some of our larger brokerages out there where they think they, they can get something, yeah, those lawsuits are going to happen. So just exactly as it happened in 2008, um, but but the polar opposite of that, the antithesis of that, which is everything about 28 versus right now, uh, back then it was the lenders. Right now we're going to see the real estate agents. If you go back and look at the largest mortgage broker or the, mar the largest mortgage firms back in 2008 that were individually owned, I'm not talking about publicly traded, but individually owned, they're all gone. They've been replaced with new companies. And what we're going to see is, is something very similar. The legacy brokerages are going to be replaced, I believe, by some of the up and coming ones that don't have the legacy that becomes a very litigious situation. So for the individual brokerage or, or real estate agent, what they're going to have to do is they're going to probably end up playing the game of musical chairs in the industry, find a place to hang their license that doesn't have these prohibitive legacy uh, litigious uh, opportunities in front of them. And they're going to continue going on and try to find a way through it. If that's going to be cracked down on, I don't know. But the thing that I kind of look at, Carl, and I wonder how you look at this, is like what we've effectively done is we've said that real estate agents are not allowed to earn an income. I mean, that's kind of what this comes down to. Yeah. So is there going to be a way? There certainly could be a way. The alternative is, is that um, a vacuum has been created. So if we see an exodus of real estate agents on the buyer side transactions, What's going to happen is, is there's going to be a group that's going to come in and fill that void. Now, if we look at the past few years, okay, uh, and I challenge anyone to do this right now, go look at um, the stocks of every financial technology firm that has tried to come in and sell real estate. Look at them all. You can figure out the day. You can figure out the actual day when they all failed. Their stocks went like this, whoop, and fell off a cliff. So they all came in trying to compete against real estate agents because they have technology on their hands. They also, I think, had air, arrogance dripping from their fingertips. And they, and they realized that they couldn't compete against real estate agents. They all got out of the business at the exact same time. They all failed miserably at it. But the thing is, is unlike years past when we had moving markets, they've got the backings of billions of dollars on Wall Street. And those billions of dollars don't take failure as easily as the help you sells uh, in the in, in the analog days. So what's going to happen is this is very easy to see because we have a precedence. We don't need to look back more than three or four years. There there is a vacuum that's being created by the by by a campaign that is smearing the reputation of real estate agents and what they do. They vacate the space right now by design, and then what happens is these fintech companies come in and they offer an alternative. That is going to that is packaged as being less expensive uh, because it involves technology. It's going to be it's going to make the the whole process more expedient 
and easier. It's going to simplify the game of real estate. But in truth, what's going to happen, because we have precedence, we already know this. There's, there's no questions about this. It is going to be more expensive, and it's going to be demonstrative to our communities. Now, as a loan officer, guys, listen, I, I, I wrote loans for 15 years. I've been representing the mortgage industry for 30 years. I know how to complain about real estate agents just as good as you. I, I like everybody. Carl, you know this. If you go to an event and you find yourself, um, you know, at a hotel bar where everybody's grabbed a beer and you got 15 loan officers that you never met before, if everybody grabs a beer at the same time and takes a sip, it's really interesting. It's like everyone at the, all of our minds are, are working in unison together and we're going to complain about real estate agents. It's the same story with the same faces in every city, everywhere you go. But here's the truth of the matter. When you work with a real estate agent, they have a legal and moral obligation. I know you think they don't fulfill it all the time, but they have a legal and moral obligation. They have their fiduciary to represent the best interests of that client. Now, to some extent, that's taking place. Some are better, some are worse, but to some extent, that's taking place. Understand this. When you look at the alternatives, the Zillas, the Open Doors, the Offer Pads, the Red Bins of the World, they have a legal and moral obligation of fiduciary too, but that is to their shareholders. In other words, when they both look at the same client, one has to represent them and one has to screw them. Legally, that's what takes place. Now, the other thing about real estate agents, and we all know this as loan officers, is that agent is going to take their commission, which I know you think is too much. We can have that conversation, whatever the case may be. But that money then is going to go into uh, a hair salon, a coffee shop, a pub, a tire store, a grocery store. And that money is going to get recirculated in your community. And that's going to make your community better. Like it or not, that's the truth, right? When the alternative, which is where we're at right now, the seminal moment, Carl, when the alternative comes in, that money is going to be take, taken and shipped back here to the San Francisco Bay Area, to Seattle, perhaps Austin, Charlotte, wherever the headquarters of these are. But what they're going to do is effectively strip mine our communities across the country of their wealth. It's going to make us more poor collectively. Um, we can go on with these, um, you know, the, the either or scenarios. But what it really kind of reminds me of is all the conversations that we have complaining about these real estate agents. It's like that old friend of you you like to bitch about. You know, that you take him away like, hey, where's Carl? Hold on a second here. I, I, I used to like Carl. I used to like to get mad at Carl and argue with Carl and hug Carl and all these things. Now Carl's gone. Well, that's what's taking place right now, and it's really making me understand the role that real estate agents play. So effectively, we're going to see a fleecing of the herds, and I don't think that that's a bad idea. And as we talked about yesterday, loan officers, listen to this real quickly. I said yesterday on The Breakfast Club, which, by the way, great gig you guys got going over there. Um, I have a real estate office, which is, I could almost hit it with a rock right out this window, right through, can you see the window through that door? Yeah, right there. Okay. Now, I can almost hit it with a rock. That real estate agent, his name is Tom Rapasarda. He does 100 buyer side transactions in a bad year. I saw it because I've looked it up on MMI and other sites like that. I know exactly where the guy's at. 100 buyer side transactions. He's got five um, buyer side agents right now. Being sued, Carl, like every single brokerage in Solano County, he's being sued. He'll he, his 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 existence is very precarious. But as a loan officer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk right across that parking lot and I'm going to go into his office and I'm going to talk to his five buyer side agents. Well, I've allotted an hour of my day because I time block my days. I have to because most salespeople aren't really good with their time, so I have to be extra vigilant about what I do in my time. I'm going to allocate an hour of my day to go over there. That means I can effectively speak with each one of his buyer side agents for 20 minutes. That's my hour. Now, here's the reality of the situation. Those five buyer side agents in the next 60 days are going to turn down to one or two buyer side agents. Mm -hmm. Now, the deals are still going to come in. Okay. The same amount of deals are going to come in. But what's going to happen is, is now I can allocate a half hour to each one of them or a full hour to the individual one. Now, I, as a loan officer, I, I like those numbers better. You know, because now all I have to do is convert one. Now it's all or nothing, isn't it? It's all or nothing, which means I have to up my game. I have to up my value proposition to that one in order to get it, because I also know there's going to be fewer loan officers. There's going to be other people who see the same opportunity as me. So what I have to do is I have to be better at my game. I have to up my game 
but then the reward is going to be significantly higher. So the question then becomes, who's got the gumption to do it? Now, for a loan officer, this is the, 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 the biggest takeaway from this. From you individually, what you can do right now All right. is really focus on your value proposition, really focus on who you are. And when you're going to have that, co that conversation with fewer agents out there, understand that the conversion might be harder, but the reward's going to be greater. Then th th my last point, I know that I'm droning on here, but um, our bar is set right here, Carl. In this industry, we're set right, right. Right, 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 right there. <laughs> in other words, we don't have to be the greatest person in the world. In fact, all we have to be is genuinely ourselves and really believe in what we're doing and know and know that we're going to make it through this market and take that message. And I think share it with these agents and we'll do a great, we'll do great with it. Uh, for those that can't get the simple message of actually taking action, uh, it, it could be it could be a difficult transition. Now you asked me in in conclusion to your question here. You said like what's what's the one thing that agents or realist or loan officers need to do right now? And it's really this simple. They know the answers. We know the answers. Uh, you've heard them a million times. You've heard them from a million coaches. We we know we know what the answers are right now. We need a direction, but most importantly, we need to take action. Move your feet right now. If you're watching this right now, today right this moment is when it starts. So, man, a lot of good stuff there, Brian. So, in essence, you know, one of the things I heard you say, I was taking some notes here as you're talking, that we're definitely going to see a thinning of the herd. Yeah. But but what I'm what I'm hearing you say is, um, some of the large, uh, and we're not gonna we're not gonna name names here. Everybody knows oh. who they are, right? That, that these large uh, real estate uh, uh, institutions, uh, let's let's call it the big box real estate stores that a lot of those are going to go under yeah, uh, and they're going to separate to a little bit more boutique um, regional brokerages as opposed to national bro uh, brokerages so that they're not as attractive to, to get sued, which is right. a, a horrible way to conduct business. Right. Is, is, right. is I, I, I have to make myself so I'm not attractive to an, a, to, to getting sued. Right. I, I can't look like I'm a big pocket. Uh, but the actual, and there's going to be a thinning of the herd, what I heard you say of the actual real estate agents, but you know, the winners will find a way to win and the losers will find a way to lose. And so the thinning of the herd, what I think I hear you say is going to be the lower producing anyway, which may or may not have had much effect on the business anyway. And so it's just going to make the average real estate agent left uh, a higher producing real estate agent and more worthy of a loan officer's time. Uh, for business-wise, frankly, just like what we've seen in the mortgage uh, industry, I think there's been half or, or more uh, loan officers drop off the map here in the last couple of years. Yeah. But again, those of you that, that are watching and listening to this today on the podcast or watching this on Facebook, uh, you're the ones that survived it, right? Uh, you're the one that survived it and you're the ones that took action. So it's going to be the same thing on the real estate end. Those that are actually I hate to say worthy, but those that those that took action to stay in business, to generate business, are still going to do so. Here's my question. Sure. So as a general rule, I've always really gone after the buyer's agent as a general rule yeah. because they deal with the buyer, right? Buyer's agent, they deal with the buyer. And and that that's always been the main focus of my of my time. Should I be doing because we can only do so much in a day? If I'm gonna be prospecting, say four hours a day. Should I, instead of prospecting to buyer agents three of those four hours, should I back that off a little bit and go after more of the listing agents? Should I uh, not put as much focus on the agent and go more to some of the, you know, divorce, some of these other areas that uh, referral partners, like where, if you're advising me on where to spend the majority of my time uh, on prospecting, what, what, would it, what would that be? Go to the mortuary. Go to the mortuary. Seriously, think about this. How many loan officers are going to the mortuary right now? How many? How, honestly, how many are doing it? Nobody's doing it. You'd be the only one. That means you're going to get the business. And guess what? When people die, the silver tsunami, the baby boomers, when they die, they have a house with a ton of equity. You couldn't find better business than going to a damn mortuary. Go to a mortuary. That's a great idea. Also, the other one is go to your garbage man. 
Go to your garbage man. The next time he picks up your garbage, go out there and give him a present and tell him how thankful you are. You know what a garbage man does? He sees every house that is cleaning it out. They he, they know. Hey, who's picking? Who's 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 got more garbage on the curb? Because if they have garbage on the curb, they're probably selling their house. <laughs> right? These are great alternatives. You need to be the only person. Nobody has ever hit a mortuary or garbage man. So, so uh, uh, the answer, uh, very you know, slapsticky about this is, yeah, yeah. I mean, keep your eyes open as a loan officer. You got you got to look for the opportunities that are in front but, of you. But should I should I be should I be taking my focus off the buyer's agent and onto the listing agent? Uh, not necessarily. Um, now, if somebody actually uh, if somebody actually um, is as in tune with their business to the level that you're speaking of, to where they understand that I've got an hour of time that I've allotted here, they've got it time block, time block, time block. If you if you understand what your business, if you're analyzing your business, then what you understand is is that things can be fluid; they can change. If your business is that, if you're that disciplined in your business, yeah, take an extra hour and put it towards a listing agent. Do it. I mean, do it, and then see what your results are. If, if, because if you can time block that much, then you're going to see what the results are. That's not necessarily a bad idea. For those of you who don't have that discipline in place, to where you're you don't see your business for what it is on a day by day, even hour by hour basis. Um, I would stick with the status quo because here's the thing agents right now, I, I can't solve, we can't solve all the problems, Carl. I just have to assume that these agents in, the, in this industry is going to try to, they're going to find a way to get these agents paid as they rightfully should be paid as there is still alternatives on the table. Um, the next, now I read to you just a moment ago, exactly what NAR said, their, their words, not mine. So there's, we don't need to, we don't need to speculate. It's exactly what NAR said. Now, if I scroll down to the next chapter of exactly what NAR said, they said, um, further, NAR has agreed to enact a new rule that would require MLS participants working with buyers to enter into written agreements with their buyers. NAR continues, as it has done for years, to encourage its members to use buyer brokerage agreements that help consumers exactly what service and value will be provided and for how much. So NAR says, hey, listen, we're going to take the buyers, we're going to take commissions off the table. It's not going to be part of our MLS. It's not going to be part of our contracts. We're out of that game right now, admitting fault, which was a real big problem. They yeah. shouldn't have done that. But yeah. they also go on to say, we understand the value that buyer agents agree, and we're going to leave it up to you to figure out how you're going to get paid. So all of these brokerages who are trying to hang on to their agents and try to hang on to their profit margins, which... I can't even believe we're having this conversation, but but they're going to take the interpretation from NAR, their representative association, and they're going to find a way. Now, is it going to come in the comments or, you know, I had a conversation, I I, I think it was with Frank. He says, you know, there you you there's there's a private section in every MLS where you can kind of put in there what you're thinking. Are they going to put it in there? Hey, listen, I've negotiated four and a half, five and a half percent, and this money is going to, I'm going to take my commission and I'm offering one and a half, two percent to uh, uh, the 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 agent representing a, who who brings the winning bid, you know. And you think about that, like with commissions. If you're we we talked about this, you're going to sell your house right now, Carl. Are you willing to give a percentage of money to the agent who seeks out the clients, shows them all the properties, shows them your house, and brings you? They bring you the winning bid. Hey, Carl, guess what? I'm Brian. I'm a real estate agent over here. I, I, I've I been showing these agents, I've been showing these clients properties for the past couple of months. And I and what I'm bringing to your doorstep, Carl, is I'm bringing you the best offer you've seen in the past 75 days. Are you going to reward me for my time and my effort? And the answer is obvious. Of course you're going to. In fact, I want to offer a commission because I'm greedy. I want to offer a commission because I'm selfish, I'm self-centered, and I want the most that I can get for Brian. And the way for me to accomplish that is by offering a commission. So I think, listen, loan officers, focus on you. Focus on what you can do. Focus on taking that action. Focus on time blocking. Focus on reaching out to the agents, the buyer's agents or the seller's agents. We can sit here and have conversations all day about what real estate agents can do, but I can't control that because I'm not one. I've got to believe that they're going to find a solution based on what their association says. So yeah. I'm leaving that one alone and I'm going to go after my agents in the same manner that I did yesterday, because that is the best option on the table. You know, I've always thought uh, just on a personal note that the buyer's agent, frankly, should get the lion's share 
of, of the commission. I've always thought that like if there's, I think the standard is like 6%. I've always thought it'd be, I don't know, more equitable if it was like listing agent two, buyer side four, because like you, I'm looking to attract as many offers as possible. And the, the higher commission I do the buyer's agent, the more they're attracted to show my house as one of the, one of the 10 that they show their client when they're riding around, you know, out of a hundred houses, I want to be one, I want to be one of the 10 that they show. So, so one thing that we do know, at least so far, or, or I think we know is I've, I've had loan officers reach out to me and say, well, the buyer's agents are reaching out to loan officer. Can you just put my commission in the loan? And we, we know that at least Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA and VA, the conventional type loans, that you can't just throw that into the loan, at least not today. Do you think this is going to end up being just like my, my thought on this? And you're much more in tune, which is why I'm interviewing you and you and you, not me. Uh, my thought on this was this is going to end up just being another disclosure that the seller and, and buyer, I guess, ends up signing, saying that they know that the buyer's agent is getting a commission. And, and um, is that what you, do you think that's what this is going to end up being just another disclosure? Or do you think it's going to be no, Carl, it goes way more than that. This is going to be completely disruptive to the industry. Well, I don't, I don't think it, Carl. I know it. All I have to do is listen to NAR. I just, all I have to do is listen to what they said. They said for you to get your commission, you're going to have to clearly define what it is that you're doing. And then you ask for the commission. NAR, NAR's already, they, they've laid it out. They've laid out what needs to take place. Again, their words, not mine. So yeah, of course it's going to be that. It has to be that. Um, there's there's no other option. Um, now, if the regulators and the lawyers are going to agree with that, I'm not sure. I I but I I I think at the end of the day, I I kind of think that's where we're at. Think back to um, uh, I think it was GFE 2010. I, I I could be, I could be screwing this whole thing up, but you'll get the idea. There was a point when mortgage brokerages had to put on their HUD one back when before we had TRID when when we had our TILAs is we had to put on our service release premium and um, our uh, well, our SRP and our and our yield spread premium. We had to yeah. put that out there to, to disclose what we were actually making. Then yeah. every broker in the country said, oh my God, everything is going to fall apart. This is uh, this is horrible. Uh, we're not going to be able to make it the same money. We have to disclose this. I might as well go to an alternative banking platform. And they did. But the, the truth is, is nothing happened. All of it was disclosed. It became another paper. And, and we, and, and we literally, we had all this, um, uh, sound and fury representing nothing as, as Faulkner and Shakespeare said, right. It didn't do anything. I think it's going to be the same thing here. And, and, yeah. and here's, here's the ironic twist of the whole thing. When we first started writing loans back in the day, when I was young, you know, um, you could, you, you could actually hold on to a stack of your loan documents when we would print them up and you'd have to take that and fill them out. And I saw those, I saw loan docs go from 50 to 300 pages. And now it's just outrageous. We've created a circumstance, um, much like we've done with the Patriot Act and listening to everybody all the time, we, where we've created a, a white noise. And, and I think when people are going into these, we haven't created clarity with more disclosures. We've created distractions with, with, with more. And yes, what we're going to do is add more papers to, in the spirit of consumer protection, we're going to add more papers to a stack of papers that absolutely nobody reads. I, I, yeah, I mean, this is what NAR is saying. Yeah, that kind of makes sense to me. But as a loan officer, again, just understand, we can have this conversation and I think it's healthy and it's helpful. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean a damn thing unless you start moving those feet. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Brian, I see we're at the uh, top of the hour here. Um, man, a lot of great information here. And I think I thought I think it was just important to kind of bring the loan officers up to speed on this, just so they can have intelligent conversations. Um, even though you know you said something uh, you said something on the Breakfast Club the other day that I really liked was I and I and I'm going to kind of summarize it the best that I think I heard it. Sure. Was as a loan officer, I wouldn't be the one to bring up this topic. I would be the ray of sunlight coming in through the stormy clouds that I'd be the, I'd be the one positive news. I, I, I think it's good to know these things. So if they bring it up, frankly, we could just sit there and listen and, and empathetically nod our head. Uh, I suppose, you know, just kind of shut up and listen. Uh, Cause sometimes that's just what somebody wants to do. It's just somebody to talk to. Um, and, and, and just to be the, the, to be as a loan officer, be the calm in the storm, 
uh, tell them any way possible that you got their back and you're offering solutions to, um, uh, to, to help them, uh, uh, get through this stuff. And, um, yeah, don't, don't be part of the storm, be part of the calm. And I, yeah. I, I really like the way you said it. You said it much more eloquently than I just did, but, uh, but that's kind of what I heard you saying. I'm sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you know, I, I'll just, uh, because I can't shut up here. Uh, just give me, give me a little latitude on this one. Uh, Carl, the other day, um, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a place in my life right now where things are transitioning. So in, in a very positive way. So my daughter has moved down to San Diego, me and my daughter, mm. thick as thieves. Tight. She's seven, she's 700 miles away. Um, she sent me a text. We talk every day, every single day. In fact, my last call I had before I went to bed was with her. Um, I got a text message at three o'clock in the morning. Hey dad, I need to talk to you. Now I didn't get that text message till six. She wasn't picking up her phone at six o'clock in the morning. And it became very, very, very apparent to me that I couldn't do anything about it. Like whatever it is she needed. Mm. I, she, she, she was a, she's a 12 hour drive way down in San Diego to me. There's nothing I can do about it. And, and that's very vulnerable because I always kind of felt like, you know, that I've got control of the situation we can, but I, I didn't. And then on the same day, me and my wife went down to, uh, we were shopping the, what, what does she call it? Um, Oh, something therapy. What is any uh, retail therapy is I think what my wife. Okay. Was. Okay. Okay. And, uh, we ran into, um, two of my daughter's lifelong friends who, by the way, I've known these kids since they were this tall. They've been in my house every weekend. No, these, these, these girls are my kids. And they started showing me pictures of Marley and and they said, I don't know if you're allowed to see these. And it was her, it, it was her Instagram and it was very, very innocent. You know, it was her and her boyfriend yeah. and they're laughing and having a good time. And I realized when I looked at her, I'm like, my God, it really was a, one of those moments. I'm like, she has her own life. It's, mm. this is, this is her own thing. It was very interesting for me with these two moments to realize that I'm not in control of things that I thought I was in control of. Mm. Um, with my business, there's things that I'm, I'm, it made me look at other areas of my life. There's things that I'm in control of and things that I'm not. Um, I'm not in control of what's going on with agents right now. I'm not, I, I'm not, I might think I have control of it, but I don't. The only thing that I can control really is what I do and how I choose to conduct myself. And as a loan officer right now, what you need to do is double down on yourself, double down on your activities. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Your failure, your success is not going to be a result of what's taken place in real estate over the past couple of weeks. Your failure or success is going to be incumbent upon and completely dependent upon what you do today. It, it, it just is. It's always been that way. And that that component has not changed. If you want to know what you can actually effectively do to um, uh, move the bar in your business, it's change how you behave and what you do with the hours that you uh, are, 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 the hours that you're spending on your business. Have purpose-driven days. Mm -hmm. Analyze your business time block your shit, reach out to these folks and understand that that's a variable you can't control. We are the action, my friends. We are not the outcome. Understand that you're the action. So be the best that you can be. And it's, I'm, I'm really into stoicism right now. That's kind of my thing. So as Marcus Aurelius once said, treat defeat or treat victory the same way. There's no difference. It's how you conduct yourself. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you win, I think. At least I'm going with that story, Carl. Good stuff, Brian. Man, good stuff. Hey, uh, this is the kind of thing we talk about on Loan Officer Breakfast Club. If you're not a part of Breakfast Club, uh, join us over at LoanOfficerBreakfastClub.com, LoanOfficerBreakfastClub.com. Uh, we're on every morning, Monday through Thursday, soon to be Monday through Friday, though, um, at uh, 8.30 uh, a.m. till 9 a.m., uh, and it's free for loan officers. And then Brian does a really cool thing. He does it uh, every day, Monday through Friday, and sends it out as a recording. And it's a typically about a three to five, six minute uh, little boost of information, industry knowledge, things uh, things that, uh, that's happening in a uh, in our industry. And sometimes it's a great interviews that are like twenty and thirty minutes long, kind of like like this one of industry leaders. Really good stuff. And that's at mortgageshots.com. Mortgage shots.com and uh and you can watch that any time of the day because he sends it out as a recording so uh really good stuff brian uh, is there something i should have asked you today i didn't get or do you think we covered it okay no man just have a great day dude yeah like, just make it a great day i appreciate you brian good stuff man
Likewise. Thank you, Carl.